given we've got Laurie with us, um, I thought I might talk actually about virtue. Um, and the link is that um, apart from, in a way, we're being asked to find some virtues within us to tolerate this time. Um, I had a quite long standing interest in positive psychology um, as I, I guess the area that Laurie is going to touch on, if not explore in some depth. Um, and it's, it's very fact, it's interested me a lot actually how, in fact, it's sort of moved from trying to tackle happiness head on to thinking about the qualities of our character, you might say, who we are as people, um, virtues, in other words, and then seeing that that's important. So I thought I could talk a little bit about that, hoping it's relevant to our times as well as to the subject of this evening. And as always, as a kind of, you know, hopefully a bit of a launch pad for what Tom and Laurie then go on to say, just to get our, our brain cells ticking over a bit. Um, one thing I think is really important, and the reason why I quite like the word virtue, although it can feel a bit old fashioned, is that virtue is not morality. And morality is about doing the right thing. And virtue, strangely actually, can be precisely about doing the wrong thing, but then learning from it. And figures like Aristotle always said um, that you need to be able to reflect on what's going on in life in order to um, develop yourself. Um, a favorite analogy for Aristotle was the archer. And he says, the archer has to miss the target countless times before they're able to hit it. And life is a bit like that when you're working on your character. And um, just to give it an extra twist, I, I think the reason why virtues are actually fundamentally so valuable, it's not just that they make life go a bit better, they make you feel a bit more in life, um, but actually they open life up to you. Um, I actually think of them as really nothing to do with um, behavior at all actually anymore, so much as ways of seeing. And I think that good virtues are good because they massively expand your perception of life. You know, so if you think of the four cardinal vir virtues, um, temperance um, was one. Now you might say this is about being calm, responding well and so on, um, but actually, What's really a joy about temperance is that it enables you to see clearly. If you're temperate, you're able to see more clearly. Um, prudence is another one of the cardinal virtues. And you, know, you might say that's about being wise, responding in a kind of a sensible way, um, but actually it enables you to see with great discernment as well. So depth opens up in life with prudence and um, courage, um, more obvious virtue nowadays, responding bravely perhaps, but with courage, you can see into the darkness, you can see the shadows. So again, life opens up that little bit more. Um, you take the point and um, think about what we can see even in these dark and difficult times or these just even if it's just a bit different and strange from you. What qualities can you find within yourself that open up life, even when it feels that life might be um, turning down? Now, just one more thought, um, just to reference Aristotle again. Um, another little helpful thing that, well, a big helpful thing that he says actually is that um, developing this idea that you learn about how to see more in life from the mistakes you made. He also advised that you can think about it as kind of trying to get a median point between two extremes. So courage, he said, was the median between foolhardiness, sort of throwing yourself into the middle of it willy-nilly, um, and um, timidity, which is running in the opposite direction. And if you can sort of gauge your response and try and work to some sort of midpoint, then you'll find, in this particular case, the medium between foolhardiness and timidity, um, you'll find courage emerging. It comes of it. So again, you can sort of learn by reflecting, by seeing um, these qualities of life. Um, one that I've grown particularly to like, actually, in all this is humility. And the reason is, is because humility has, on first glance at least, to me, horrible connotations really, you know, about putting yourself last, self-abnegation, has all sorts of horrible religious overtones, perhaps if you've got a religious past like me. Um, but when you think about it differently as responding to life openly, sometimes it's likened to the sea being humble, because the point about the sea is it puts itself in the lowest place. And so everything can flow into it, it can embrace and hold everything. And so it can see everything. 
no pun intended, it misses nothing. Um, so think about virtues, think about them in terms of this character trait in one way, but making mistakes, finding the median in order to be able to see more and more of life. And perhaps that can transform something of these times. Perhaps it links to what Laurie and Tom will discuss now. Um, you know, pick maybe one virtue, have a day on one virtue, temperance, prudence, courage, justice, humility, faith, hope, love, equanimity, meta, whatever. Um, you can easily find sort of lists of them um, and, and, and try it out. Uh, make something of this time in that way as well. Tom, Laurie, I wonder what you make of that. I love it. I think virtues are kind of underutilized. In fact, there's lots of evidence that as we're uh, engaging with our strengths, like if we take time to sort of follow virtues that are the virtues that we hold really dear, um, that we end up kind of boosting our well-being. In fact, one of my favorite exercises that I give my students in our happiness class is I make them do what's called the strengths date, but it bas basically could be called the virtues date. You pick virtues that both of you have, whether that's like courage or humor or love of learning, which is another virtue and you like go on a date or you do some activity where you both get to do that. And the research shows that that's like a really nice way to improve happiness. So virtue dates, even virtual virtue dates during COVID, awesome <laughs> idea. Uh, Laurie, this is absolutely, it's so good to listen to you. Now, how did you get into this line of work in the first place? You're a psychology professor at Yale. You are now running this massively successful podcast. It's so popular. I've been seeing the comments popping up. You know, pe people are, you're, you're improving people's lives or changing lives all over the world. But I think it started with your students and mm -hmm. really your, your observation that they were basically not idle enough. They were, in a very American way, um, working too hard. Yeah, no, this was, a, I, I, I've been teaching at Yale for over a decade, but just in the last couple of years, I took on this new role as a head of college, like kind of like Hogwarts. I'm like one of these faculty that live on campus with students in the colleges. And, you know, what I saw, I mean, I kind of knew like the college student culture was sort of a grind culture at Yale, you know, they're all type A and they work hard to get here and stuff. But I didn't expect to see how bad it was and the kinds of consequences it was having, right? I mean, these students are just incredibly depressed. So right now the stats in the US are that 40% of US college students report being so depressed it's difficult to function. Over 60% say that they're overwhelmingly anxious and almost two thirds say that they're lonely most of the time, right? Like this is- Two thirds are lonely. Two thirds, yeah. I mean, they live with other students on campus. And if you talk to them, you know, you get a sense of like, oh, hey, how's it going? The most constant response I would get was like, this fast forwarding through life, like, oh, if I could only get to Friday, if I could only get to the weekend, if I could only get to spring break. And I just had this deep sense that they were fast forwarding their years when they were 19 years old and the whole world was open to them and they had their peers, super interesting, smart peers around them and resources galore to just kind of chill. And do they're it. not enjoying this. This is supposed to be an enjoyable period of their lives, as you say. Yeah, I mean, at Yale, the, the, the kind of school song at Yale is this kind of very cheesy song called Bright College Years. But this is the idea is like, these are supposed to be bright years. It's not supposed to be like time when 40% of the people around you are too depressed to function, right? And so I think the students just really needed, you know, a, a change of pace. And so that's where the class came from. It was a way to teach students these strategies to kind of feel happier. But again, so many of the strategies come out of an idler, idler playbook, right? I mean, one of the big things I teach students is this I, so the social science -y idea of time affluence, which is basically just like having some free time, not feeling time famished where you're just kind of uh, just kind of overscheduled all the time and super busy all the time. Um, Self-compassion, right? Giving yourself some grace, giving yourself a break, right? Like these are things I need to present the scientific studies on to these students so they believe them and realize they're important things to put in their life. So do you have to put these points to your students with, with backup from you know, uh, actual research. It, it, it wouldn't be enough to say um, this was something that Buddha thought. Yeah, I mean, it would be nice if we could just go back to the ancients, especially those that have been, you know, making the right case for like 3000 years and like, you know, it's kind of getting somewhere. But these students, I think, again, you know, they, they have this sort of cult of science and so they want to see the scientific evidence, right? But, you know, to be fair, sometimes, you know, the cults of 3000 years are wrong. This is why, you know, Mark was just talking about rejecting religion. Like they don't, the old, the old school doesn't always get it right, you know? Okay, but where, where did this culture come from? For, you know, um, Yale probably wouldn't say it was coming from them. Uh, the parents m would probably claim, no, well, we, 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 you know, we're not pushing them too hard. Uh, somewhere, someone's to blame, aren't they, for, the, for, the, for this sort of pressure uh, that your young students are feeling and, and this attitude to life, which is that it's just a, a, a sort of fierce competition. Yeah, I mean, I think it's been 
breeding for a long time, right? I mean, capitalism in lots of ways is to blame <laughs> at a really basic level. I yeah. mean, but locally, I think, you know, these kids, you know, from, from birth have basically thought like getting into an Ivy League school is the way, you know, you have a good life, right? And as soon as they get to an Ivy League school, they think, okay, what's the next accolade? Like maybe I need to become a doctor or I need to go into finance or I need to make a lot of money. They're just like constantly chasing this so-called carrot of what would make for a good life. And my worry is that first of all, scientifically speaking, in terms of all the ancient wisdom, the carrot they're going after is just wrong, right? It's some like circumstance that just isn't gonna work. But also I think we don't like realize at what cost they're going after that care. You know, it'd be one thing if they're just kind of going astray. It's like, oh, hoo -hoo, you know, whatever. But like, they're really causing themselves lifelong mental health crises um, and just like deep unhappiness and loneliness for pursuing this stuff. It's just really tragic. Now, where did you get your philosophy from that you, that you are now teaching them? Uh, you called the, the word happiness is in the uh, title of the lecture course that you, that you, you started to give the students. Um, but I think your idea of happiness is not uh, exactly positive psychology, which Mark alluded to in his in introduction. Positive psychology, to me, you know, I've always had a slight problem with it, but it sounds a little bit like, oh, well, you know, we're trying to make you happy so that you can work harder for the corporation. Um, it's a bit Aldous Huxley, you know, in Brave New World, he said, in the future, I can imagine happiness uh, committees which yeah. are working on the problem of how to make people love their own slavery. But your idea of happiness is, is, is much deeper, I think. And you talk about, for example, the ancient Greeks as, as Mark does. Yeah, I mean, I like to think that, you know, I do draw on the science a lot, right? Because I wanna make sure I'm giving these students practices that really work. I don't wanna make things worse, right? But honestly, most of the science that I think is great science is actually built on the ancients. Like Buddha got it right, Aristotle, oh my gosh, and spades got it right. You know, the Stoics were like totally on top of this stuff, right? So I think you do need to go back and look at the ancient wisdom. Um, I think you need to look at the wisdom of today. Honestly, one of the traditions that I actually started with, you know this from being on my podcast, was actually your work, right? Like I read How to Be Idle back when I was in grad school around the time that I was like getting caught up in grind culture and feeling like there was no alternative. And reading that was kind of like, wait a minute, <laughs> like there's, there's another path, right? We don't have to do this. And I think we actually need more avenues to show students that there's another way. You know, so much of what they get on TV from their parents in their culture is like grind, grind, grind. I think they don't often see that there's an alternative path. So what kind of things have your students said to you? I think I'm right to say that your course immediately became very, very popular, which is a sign that people are very miserable. Yeah, it was a little bit uh, humbling and kind of weird. So the class became late. The first time I taught it, it became Yale's largest class ever in its over 300 year history. So I think that gives us hope. It's not students taking computer science or econ or something like they're kind of flocking to a class about the good life. So that was good. Um, we, in part because of the popularity, we decided to put the class online. That's actually what a lot of folks um, in the comments are talking about. Uh, it's online called The Science of Wellbeing on Coursera.org for free. Because um, I'm a big believer that you put, you know, free stuff out there to help people. Um, and in just the first few months, over 500,000 people signed up for the class, which was incredible. Um, what's even maybe more telling is that since March of 2020 till now, so since basically the lockdown started in the US, we had over 3.2 million people sign up for the class. So, and even an order of magnitude bigger uh, since we kind of run it. Started wow. Last during yeah, the so it's millions and millions of people that have found it and you're helping them and they're, they're really quite miserable. Now, what about the effects of, of lockdown on mental health? Because, you know, okay, here we are on the 28th of January, or is it the 29th? I mean, it must be the most depressing day of the, the last sort of few years. Um, you, you think lockdown's going to come to an end? It doesn't. You think January is going to come to an end, and it never seems to end. Uh, so we're seeing, you know, certain people in the UK are finding lockdown really depressing, yeah. um, and certainly this time of year is, you know, is, is generally depressing. What are you seeing in your students? Are there are they totally miserable about it a bit? Because I mean, surely their lives have been uh, restricted. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, lockdown, it's worth just like talking about how miserable lockdown is, right? Like when we are social creatures at heart, right? You know, some of our happiest times are when we're social. And there's lots of evidence suggesting that people who are more social are happier. And it's not just like hanging out with your friends and your family and your besties. It's like what researchers call weak ties, like, you know, chatting with the barista at the coffee shop, you know, that dude who goes to your pub that you don't even really know his name, but when you're sitting near him, you chat all the time. Like, 
those actually impact those kinds of connections actually impact our happiness a lot and for the most part lockdown means that those go away like in a flash they're just gone from our lives and it's not clear i mean these kinds of events are awesome it's not clear that they rebuild fully all those weak ties and so we're getting a well-being hit that way most of the ways we used to enjoy our routines you know the going to the pub taking a walk outside you know casually running into folks just kind of being out and idling a lot of that is really limited. And so there's like all these things that are having a hit on our well-being. So it makes sense that we're kind of miserable. And January is just a miserable month anyway. In the UK, you all have Blue Monday, which I think was like last Monday, which is statistically the most depressing day in the UK. And that was like so, so was cool. pre COVID, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, but, well, but we do love complaining about anything. Yeah, that's true. The stiff upper lip is, is very <laughs> thinly failed. For it's correct. not really in evidence anymore. Um, but, but you mentioned the students and I actually think you know, it's worth kind of seeing it from their perspective on the, you know, on the one hand, like it's like, it sucks to be a 19 year old. It sucks. I'm 40 and lockdown sucks. I'm so happy that I'm not a college student who had access to all these friends and parties and things. Right. That said, there are these kind of funny, like hopeful spots for them that, that they're actually enjoying. So one funny data point is like, so, you know, we have a normal sort of, you know, tide of mental health crises as all those statistics I told you about before would suggest. But actually we had less mental health emergencies this past semester in the fall during lockdown than we ever had before. And I was trying to figure out why that is. And it's for two reasons. One is like, there's just less stuff for students to do. I mean, these students are used to padding their resume with extra curricular, extra, extra, you know, sports and dance practice and entrepreneur club and blah, blah, blah. And for the most part, all that stuff just got canceled. So they actually just have some free time. <laughs> like they can actually like grab a novel and read a book and just not feel so overwhelmed. The other thing is I think more so than previous semesters, sadly, they're actually engaging in in real life social connection, right? What do I mean by that? Like they're on Zoom all the time like this for class. And while this is fun with a beer for an hour, when you're on it for eight hours a day, it's really depleting. The last thing they wanna do at night is pull out a screen and watch Netflix or go on social media or whatever. And I think that means they're actually having new conversations with their students in a way that they might not have for the last five years. In the way that I remember doing in college in the 90s, you know, till four in the morning, they have these distractions that steal their attention normally. But those are just so exhausting right now. They've kind of moved away from them. And, and it's reflected in the fact that we see such tighter friendships from the students on campus. Oddly, they actually report feeling less lonely than they did before the lockdown. So I actually think it's this funny moment where because everything has to be on screens, the real life interaction has become more valuable than it had been before, and maybe more valuable than that, you know, Netflix binge. And that means they're kind of connecting in a different way. So I'm hopeful that certain habits, at least that are happening on campus that students are learning, are actually making them more happy rather than less. Well, that's, that's, that's a lovely thought. And in a way, it reminds me of the Epicureans, because, you know, clearly that the Stoic philosophy is a, a, a good response to when things are so bad and they're out of your control we can only control things your reactions and so on and so forth um and we hear less about the epicureans i think perhaps because people think that the epicureans uh were just about luxurious living and of course that wasn't the case they're about simple living yeah. and appreciating the small things and uh, victoria and i've noticed our daughter is 18 and we're like are you okay it must be a nightmare and um she's you know she goes for a walk with her friend and she re re really enjoys that and really values that and so perhaps there's one of the people who use this phrase silver linings, which is really annoying, but you know, one of the kind of upsides might be this kind of uh, sort of concentration or, or a return to appreciation of the simple things, I suppose. No, totally. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's in two ways we're going to see this. One is like, it just forces us to pay attention to the simple things now because we're just like less frantic, you know, like I can't take time to taste my morning coffee when I'm zipping off to another meeting or have to, you know, hop in my car to go on a commute or something like that. But now, you know, I'm here, I have a little bit of space. You can take time to kind of be there and enjoy it. I actually find this, it's a funny way it comes from all this conversation about COVID of like, have you lost your sense of taste and smell? I can sometimes be a little hypochondriac. So I'm like, have I lost my taste of smell? You know, like, can I smell the beer? But because of that, I'm going around like smelling things and noticing if I'm tasting them in this like different way than before. And just something as simple as that means you're being present, right? Like you're savoring the things that are happening. 
And so that can be powerful for our well-being. But I also think there's a thing that there's a kind of big boost in happiness that we're all going to get once this is over, right? Like there are so many things before this lockdown that I took for granted, like being able to walk to my coffee shop and get my favorite latte, right? Like walking through the grocery store, you know, like looking at produce rather than ordering it on some like curbside pickup thing, right? Or like, just like, seeing a friend across the table like, in the, being in the same room. Hug, you know, like, you know, giving my mom a hug, right? Like just yeah. so such simple. And I feel like once we get it back, we're all going to go through this period that this thing we got used to we got hedonically adap adapted to in the like you know social sciencey terms all this is going to be fresh and new and we're going to have such gratitude and appreciation for it so we're yeah, all going to be like big boost <laughs> will, will it last though i mean will, will we get a thing where like I, I can't wait for this all to be over and then when it's over you go back to the the, the same level of misery you were before lockdown well, this is where I think, you know, some of the kind of, you know, copying the habits of things like the Stoics can come in, right? You know, I think the Stoics get a bad rap, especially from idlers and the Epicureans were like, oh, they were into pleasure, but the Stoics were into pleasure too. They were into emotion, actually. They just didn't like negative emotion. And, but, and one of the ways they kind of allowed, uh, one of the kind of pieces of advice they gave us that helped us get around our negative emotion is through this technique of imagining the worst things possible, right? You might think that that's not good for happiness, but actually taking time in the morning as they suggested to imagine, imagine today I'm in a lockdown again, right? You know, when we're out of this, you know, when you can go to the coffee shop and the grocery store, imagine if you started every morning with a quick 10 minute, remember lockdown, remember January, 2021 and how much that sucked. Now, when you walk out and you go to a coffee shop, no matter how long the line is, you know, if you spill your coffee, it's still gonna feel a little good. And so these quick meditations, these quick counterfactuals about things maybe being worse can let you, it's a practice you can use to sort of appreciate things more. So I think our natural tendency, you're right, is just to like go back to it and stop appreciating it. I think this will weigh heavily. I know like, you know, in the US, like my, like, you know, grandparents who were like in depression days, you know, that that's experience stayed with them. You know, they appreciated certain small things in a way that, you know, it was like grandma, like, you know, you don't have to save all your quarters or something like that. But like, I think we're, our generation is going to have this where we're going to hold on to social connection, hold on to these routines we've missed in, in a little bit of a tighter way. Now, what about book reading? Uh, Victoria and I worried that our children don't read books, but I think they've been reading books a bit more since lockdown. What about your students? Definitely. I think, you know, the last thing they want is like, to be on the screen more. And that means they're like picking up physical books in a way that they hadn't. I think they also just have time. Um, I had my students when I first set up the class with these, you know, a thousand students showed up. I gave them the survey of like, why do you want to, you know, take the class? What do you think the culture's like? And one of the most like harrowing as a professor comments I heard from my students was one student said, you know, we're just too busy at Yale to do normal things. Like I never pick up a book. And I was like, oh, my professor heart just broke. But nowadays, I think, you know, they have time because they're not sprinting from football practice to, you know, like, you know, their dance club to their entrepreneurial thing. Like they actually have time. And so they can pick up a novel in between their classes. They're not so time famished that everything is so frantic. Now, what about their partying, Laurie? So I think I remember you saying that, um, uh, you know, they, they they did before lockdown anyway, that they, they did party, but... Um, they had to squash their partying into a kind of very small uh, window um, because they'd be working so late and they would like drink an enormous amount of vodka in about two minutes and then go out and then collapse. It was almost yeah. like a sort of Yale efficient way of partying. Yeah, it's pretty sad, you know, so, we, you know, in the 90s, again, when I went to college, like there was drinking on campus, there was binge drinking, it was a thing that you talked about, but it was a like leisurely happy binge drinking that happened over long periods. Nowadays, the research shows the form of the binge drinking is different because they're so busy. They're like frantically doing work and doing work to like one in the morning. But now they're like, now I have to party and get drunk really fast. And so they do a series of shots, not like with friends and like some game, just like to catch up really quickly so that they can get their buzz on. It's like called like going big or going home. And it's like, it's not a kind of happy <laughs> leisurely, even they're partying is grind culture. It's like, do it as quickly as possible and as, as efficiently as possible. It's really quite sad. And so the hope is that because it's not so much of a grind elsewhere, maybe that can calm down too. You know, maybe they can get to the point of, you know, savoring their binge drinking in the way we used to, you know, back in the day. <laughs> like... so, so you're sort of like reasonably positive about this. Now, what about your everyday life? Are, are they, are your students now, um, coming to you giving Zoom lectures so you can give the lectures from home? 
Yeah, so most of, so the students are back on campus. In fact, they're, I was just telling Tom, they're sort of scrolling in and watching them kind of dragging their suitcases back to campus today because they're arriving today. Um, and what we find is that they actually like, you know, they are here on campus, but taking most of their classes via Zoom. So they have some ways to get together with one another, but most of their interaction in lectures is over Zoom. And I think it sucks, you know, I think it's like, it's the casual conversations that we're missing. And I think this is something we need to get creative about, right? Often when we're doing Zoom, it feels like a webinar meeting where we all have to, you know, be here. And it's one of the reasons I'm liking kind of scrolling through this group and seeing that some of you are like walking around or cooking or like making a cocktail or whatever. That's kind of a better way to do Zoom where it feels like we're at a cocktail party, not like sitting stationarily, you know, in our libraries kind of having this conversation. Yeah, I mean, I remember being at college uh, and in fact, going to real life events and often it wasn't actually about the event so much as the uh, conversation that happens before or after or, and, and during it, you know. Um, and I remember that wonderful sense after a lecture um, of being with two or three friends and going and sitting down and having a coffee and just, just chatting and just enjoying, you know, being together. Um, uh, and yes, you might talk about ideas as well, but it was that, that stuff that happens in between is not really happening on Zoom very much. Yeah, and but the sad thing, I mean, I think this is why in some odd ways, college level students are less affected, you know, than some of the, we older folks, is that it kind of wasn't happening anyway because of their grind culture. Um, you and I in our podcast talked before about, you know, one of my saddest observations when I became a head of college was the first time I went to our dining hall. Again, this is pre-COVID, right? I went to our dining hall expecting it to be like the loudest place on campus. You know, that was what I remember from my college days. but at the dining hall, all the students are got these big, you know, Bose headphones on or like the little ones that don't attach to anything. And they're all staring at a screen. So it's not like students talking to one another. It's, you know, they're listening to a podcast or they're, you know, chatting with their friends, you know, listening to music, chatting with their friends on Snapchat or watching a lecture or doing some homework. It wasn't like just, you know, chatter and philosophical discussions about nothing in particular, right? It was, it was not being idle, it was being efficient. And I think that kind of efficiency is feeling less fun right now, right? Like your brain just can't take that much screen time. And so I, I am seeing that the kind of like crazy efficient screen time they were doing pre-COVID, they're actually replacing with as much in-person interaction as they can get. Cause it's so rare to see another human that when they're there, you become present. You're like, oh my gosh, a person, <laughs> like, let me talk to you. <laughs> this is great. So no, It's great to hear because, you know, um, I'm really worrying about the, uh, the effects of this covid stroke lockdown um on our lives in the future just because they seem to be mediated so much via screens and you know i wrote a piece today when you read the old dystopias you know not just 1984 and brave new world but ian forces the machine stops which was written in 1909 uh they all live in these little bubbles and communicate via screen and they don't talk you know, there's no kind of physical interaction um so you sort of think, oh, this is terrible because this is, you know, Silicon Valley was big and evil enough as it was. Now it's only going to get more big and, and uh, bigger and eviler, ev more evil. <laughs> um, but you're saying, no, maybe that, maybe it, this could lead to a sort of um, outbreak of old fashioned conviviality. I'm kind of hopeful for that. We shall see. I mean, I think it, you know, the reason that that kind of screen stuff was taking off so much before is, is for two reasons. One is like, you know, the designers make these screens as addictive as possible. You know, they are little dopamine hits. They're meant to feel rewarding every time you get a ding and to scroll to the next page on your media feed and whatever. That's one reason. But the second reason is that those companies are really good at reducing the cost of entry, right? You know, if I plop down at the dining hall, you know, even when I would do it back in the day, like there's a little startup cost to be like, hey, what's your name? You know, this is gonna be awkward, right? And you like the real life talking takes a teeny bit of work. But to pull out my phone and open Instagram is no work, right? And so I think, you know, those, those two things are still going to be true. But I think what's happened is that in the absence of the social reward of in real life connection, it's like felt so much more rewarding. So maybe we'll kind of overcome the dopamine hits of these other devices. And I think we don't care about the startup cost, right? Because we want it so bad. It feels like so much, so many of us are so desperate for us and we know other people are desperate for it, right? You know, like it, right now in our US lockdown, I still get to kind of walk around outside. And if you walk by somebody on the street, you know, more so than it has been usual in the East Coast of the US, because we're very kind of Yankee stiff upper lip, the people are like, hey, hey, you know, because I think again, we're so desperate. Like we know that other people must be desperate too. And so my hope is that we'll kind of come out of this with a newer appreciation of in real life that that curve of kind of moving to a fully screened life will maybe snap out, will snap out of it, I hope. 
Laurie, that's, that's such a nice thought. Um, and now before we go back to Mark, which was your favourite of all the podcast episodes that you've so far recorded? Which was your best one? <laughs> obviously yours. I mean, to be totally honest, obviously yours, right? Uh, for those that don't know, Tom was on um, one of my episodes of the Happiness Lab podcast called For Whom the Alarm Clock Tolls. And it talks all about this phenomenon of time affluence, right? Having lots of free time. And I'm, a, I'm an aspiring idler, but because I'm like a professor and a podcaster and a head of college, like I, I stray from my, my goals sometimes. Um, and Tom was really great to remind me of this stuff. But not, not only was Tom on, he was backed up by the lovely Ashley Willens, who's a Harvard professor with a great new book called Time Smart about this concept of time famine. And she presented, you know, these wonderful data showing things like, for example, if you self-report being time famished, if you have no time to idle, that's as bad for your mental health as if you self-report being unemployed. Like we know we got to fix unemployment, that it's a huge hit on your happiness. It's as bad if you don't have time to idle. And so uh, Tom and Ashley convinced me to change my ways on that episode. <laughs> Oh, uh, you, you heard that. Yale and Harvard professors agree idleness is good for you. It's now official. It's not like a, a weird um, sideline view anymore. Um, Laurie, thanks so much. We'll just very briefly go to um, Mark and then open out to questions. And we've got under about 20, 25 minutes for questions for you, Laurie, if that's OK, from our, from our lovely audience. I see how you make people happy, Laurie. You charm <laughs> them to death. That's yeah, it's so easy. <laughs> no, um, it, I was very fascinated by a comment you made, um, perhaps earlier on, about, well, you mentioned it a few times, actually, the sort of scarcity culture, the idea that time is scarce, that resources are scarce, that even happiness is somehow scarce. And I just wonder about switching to an abundance culture. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's a massive question, and it's, as it were, not front of uh, mind for you perhaps because no, no, uh, you're interested in psychology and people but 3.2 million is a lot of people do you sense any way in which this is spreading into the wider culture you know so that when the lockdown ends we won't immediately go back to the manic growth curve of scarcity yeah. culture but maybe understand some of this abundance yeah, I mean, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head, actually. I think a lot of this for the students is about scarcity culture, right? Like they see this all as a zero sum game, right? Where like only one of us can get into this Ivy League school, only one of us can get into medical school and they're like kind of competing for this. It comes from this mentality that you got to add more and more and more in. Um, there's a wonderful book about meritocracy by uh, Michael Sandel, another Harvard professor. Sorry, we just like link, linking to all our Ivy League colleagues, but, um, but he talks about this, that like a downside of kind of everybody being able to go to schools and things like that is that the spoils of the war are really high, right? And that maybe that it's building in a sort of scarcity culture among our young people in a way it wasn't there before. Um, but yeah, but no, I mean with like, you know, so right now we have over 3 million people taking the online class. I have over 30 million downloads for the podcast, over a million for Tom's episode alone, right? Like I think people are listening and I think this is another thing that's happened in lockdown. So, you know, we can kind of go through our lives blindly without changing things for a long time. But when we have a huge change in circumstances, like you lose a job, or you lose a loved one, like some tragic thing happens, it causes you to think about your purpose in life, right? Like how things are really going. And I think a lot of people who are now having this moment where they have to kind of face what's going on in life and face whether or not they're happy, they're looking for solutions, right? Like they're looking to do something better. And so I'm really hopeful that this can cause a big change in our culture. Wow, Laurie, that's fantastic. Uh, by the way, <laughs> uh, the, the book that Laurie mentioned just now by Ashley Willens, there is a, an extract, a short extract from it um, on the Idler website at idler.co.uk, so you can check that out. Uh, over to you, Vic. Great, thanks, Laurie, thanks. So we've got a few questions for you. May we start with Amy Hubbard? Amy. Hi, Laurie, um, I, I, uh, I'm so idling through your course. I did week five, I got up to week five in lockdown one, but it changed my life. And even the recent podcast about um, exercise and now I just do 30 minutes a day and um, and it actually happens at work, you know, when you work, when you exercise for the right reason, it's brilliant. Um, but I want to ask, do you ever, um, do you ever get tired of being uh, such a renowned famous expert for happiness and want to be really publicly uh, glum or angry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, if, you, if you want to be pub publicly glum and angry now, that's absolutely fine. 
<laughs> it's just like me alone walking up the street looking glum, no one else out there. No, yeah, no. I mean, the one, I mean, if you listen to my podcast and the class, you'll realize I'm not a naturally happy person. I think that's one of the reasons people listen to me. Like I genetically, I think I'm a very glum person. Um, you know, I like suck at following all the advice I give to everyone else. And I think that that is a powerful way to be a happiness expert is because people say like, I, this is hard for me too. I'm trying to use this too. And so I think the only thing I'm sad about, you know, about like, you know, doing the podcast and doing all these amazing things is actually the time affluence part, right? Like I get really busy, right? You know, and so I have to only say yes to great events like this. I find myself turning down lots of events that are awesome that I'm like, this sounds really fun, but I can't do it because I'm trying to get better about protecting my time. So, so that's the one bad part is like, as you become a happiness expert, during a horrible lockdown and pandemic, a lot of people want to talk to you. <laughs> so you just have to say no to a lot of people. You've got a very good system, uh, haven't you, on your email saying, I might not be able to get back to you because I'm trying to follow my own lessons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> well done, you. Um, right, Kat, could we go on to Victoria Kaplan? Hi, Vicky. Hi Tom, hi guys. How's the choir? <laughs> <laughs> we, have, um, uh, so... long, we, we, we had an idler choir by the way, everybody. Um, there was sort of about 15 or 20 of us would, would meet once a week and it was really really good thing for Hearing you up. And yeah, and that, that's obviously gone. So, but anyway, sorry, I, I, let's press on. Let's not just talk about the choir, Vic. There's only 10 of us, wasn't there? <laughs> singing, singing is good. No, my question was, um, I read a lot about um, happiness from various different psychologists, uh, ancient and modern, and I, I would distill all of that into the philosophy that helping others is the kind of the thing that comes through as how to be happy. And I wondered whether you agreed with that. Uh, and if you do, what, how would you define it? Yeah. No, I think that that is borne out by all the data. If you look at happy people, happy people tend to spend more of their time volunteering, happy people tend to spend more of their money on other people. And in fact, an irony of spending your time helping others is that it actually makes you feel like you have more time rather than less. So one intervention you can do to feel more time affluent is to give your time to other people, which is ironic because you actually should objectively have less time, but you feel more like you're giving. So it affects your happiness that way. And I think this is a spot where people mess up, right? I mean, my students mess up, right? I mess up, right? Like if I'm having a crappy day, I think like, I want to, you know, buy myself a bottle of wine or like, I want to get a manicure. I want to like buy some, I want to do something nice for myself. I don't think, let me buy my assistant, you know, in Silliman College, a, a bottle of wine, <laughs> or let me like, you know, just give my friend some curbside takeout dinner, right? Like, that just doesn't compute when we're depressed or sad, we wanna do for us, but actually the data suggests just the opposite. So I think this term self-care, where in the US right now, there's this mantra of like, treat yourself, like treat yourself, it's getting it wrong. Like you'll actually get more of a happiness hit for anything you spend your time on or that you spend your money on by doing it for somebody else. And so I've started doing this a little bit more. It hasn't changed my intuitions, but I've done this a little bit more. So my birthday, I mean, at this point, everybody has had a birthday in lockdown. So it like, doesn't really look, you know, even like, like everybody's in the same boat, but I had my birthday this summer and I was so like, man, like I was I'm, like really social and I like throwing a big party for my birthday and I was all, all bumming. And I was like, what would my science tell me to do? And my science was like, you should give to others. And so I bought these very decadent bottles of champagne and gave them to each of the other people who are heads of college like me, who are in the summer, they're about to start this really scary semester with the students coming back and I wrote them each a little gratitude letter. Again, it, the branding sounds cheesy. I know Tom's like rolling his eyes right now, but I just wrote them a letter. It's like, hey, here's a bottle of champagne. And just like, you know, I really appreciate you. It's my birthday. I'm thinking about the things I appreciate and you're one of them. That act of giving them the champagne was such a better birthday. Like they all immediately called me. and was like, I care about you so much. Thank you so much. You know, they like sent me little Zoom pictures when they were popping the champagne, like drinking it out of the bottle. Like it was so much more fun than me, whatever I would have bought for myself and like kind of wallowing in my self-pity. So yeah, huge happiness lesson. Next time you're feeling down, what can you do for somebody else? You know, if you have the money to buy something for somebody else or spend your time or just like, text or call somebody you haven't talked to, like that's the way to get out of your funk. It's the way to get out of your happiness funk. It's also the way to get out of your loneliness funk. There's all this data that when people are lonely, they become kind of more inward. So they think other people don't want to hang out with them. But then we have this culture where we're all feeling lonely and wish somebody would reach out and no one is. So if you can kind of break out of your loneliness and contact someone else, it'd be so powerful. 
that's so um, different from current advertising, isn't it? Which is sort of make you anxious with the news followed by an advert, which is, you know, because you're worth it. You know, you've got to spend some money on yourself. That is the whole advertising world push, isn't it? Yeah, and I think the other, you know, I, you know, I mentioned this birthday, you know, I bought nice champagne. I actually think I would have gotten the same level of happiness if I just gave them the letter that said, you're so mean, you know, thank you so much. Like I probably didn't need to sprint. I mean, the champagne is fun because like bubbles and watching people drink out of a bottle is always really fun. But like, you don't have to buy anything, I guess is the point. Um, yeah. And that I think is one of, you know, I think Tom sees the positive psychology stuff as like, you know, pro-capitalist culture. And I think it falls into that. But actually at its core, it's deeply anti-capitalist. It's like, you can just be happy by experiencing gratitude and presence and savoring the stuff that you have. You don't have to buy anything. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to like work a crazy finance job where you contribute to like capitalist culture. Um, it's kind of deeply, you know, kind of countercultural in a good way if you read it the right way. Yeah, brilliant. Um, could we have Evelyn Crush? Evelyn, you've got a question. Hi. Hi, Evelyn. Yeah, Evelyn. By the way, Evelyn, Mark, remember Evelyn's been on um, our weekend at the uh, Gladstone's Library. Nice. Hey, Evelyn. Great. I highly recommend future work. Um, Your volume is a bit quiet. Oh, um, is this better? Can you hear me better now? A little bit. Yeah, that's okay. Closer, closer. Okay, I'll just try to get a bit closer. Um, Laura. Oh, that's that you. Now you, Oh, hang on. Now you, you've you gone been. completely it disappeared <laughs> altogether. There's an occasional sort of clicking noise. Um, now? Like a sort of uh, like a sort of avant garde musical piece. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll cut out and try to come back. No, that's good. That's, that's, that's okay now. This sorry. Is it okay now? Yes. Okay. Sorry. My question, Laurie, was you mentioned your grandparents' generation and the Depression and coming out of something like what we're going through, um, appreciating things more. On the other hand, I thought we would do that the first time we had lockdown last year and everything got very quiet. But once things calmed down a bit, everything seemed to have gone back to normal as if people didn't notice. Um, you also, also mentioned that in the dining hall, students were not con communicating with each other, but had headphones on. So my question is, do you think that social media and the internet play a big role in us being unable to appreciate things? And do you think it was better before? And you might be too young actually to answer this question, <laughs> but you know, do you think we were actually happier without all the digital stuff um, yeah, I, and able to I, appreciate it? I'm also not that young. I get the, the gray streaks are sort of hidden at the Zoom, <laughs> you know, like makes it look good. But uh, no, no, I remember distinctly the time before all this mm -hmm. stuff. And I do think we're, I'm happier. I mean, in fact, I don't think, I mean, there's so much data. If you look, it's funny, if you look at the curves, you know, depression and anxiety, they've always been going up, but they spike. And in one of my PowerPoints for the students, I plot that with um, iPhone purchases um, and the lines, you know, go perfectly together. Now, we know correlation isn't causation, but the data really suggests that these devices might be changing what we like, right? And in a, in a particularly bad way, which is I think that the worst thing that these devices do is that they, they steal our presence, right? They steal our attention. Our attention is this really important and finite resource and we give it to these devices and these devices have gotten really good at stealing it in part because there's just so much on them. Um, one of my other, perhaps my second favorite podcast episode after Tom's um, is one about good and bad screens. Um, and I interview Liz Dunn, who's this fantastic professor at UBC who studies happiness and screens. And she gives this analogy. She's like, imagine if instead of to dinner with my husband, bringing my phone to dinner with my husband when we're like out to eat, I brought this big wheelbarrow. And in the wheelbarrow was uh, photo albums since 1990, like printouts of photos, a big pile of like DVDs every book you know, in the Gutenberg library, um, a bunch of porn, like videos of cats, like every tweet that every celebrity's ever had. Like, and there's just this huge pile of all this fun stuff, right? Like I wouldn't talk to my husband. I'd be like, I wanna look at the porn. Or I wanna look at the cat video or whatever, right? Like, and her idea is like, your brain isn't stupid. Like your brain knows that on the other side of this is that wheelbarrow. And you have the, I mean, I have this here now while I'm talking to you all, like we just have these things. We have these wheelbarrows that our brain has to use a lot of control to be like, 
don't look at the cat videos, don't look at the cat videos, like, you know, you know, ex-president might have tweeted something, like, I want to see what he tweeted today, right? Like, you have to stop that. And I love my husband. He's really interesting. He's like a philosopher. He's really fun. But he might not be as interesting as like at least like 50% of the stuff in that wheelbarrow, right? Just because there's so much of it, right? You know, all the books in my library behind me are fantastic, but they might not be as interesting as this little device. And so I think that's the worst thing that phones have done is they put all this stuff together. It's this one tiny stimulus that's like the built to be the most interesting thing. And of course our brains fall for it. And so, you know, I've gotten really good at at least, you know, I mean, this is actually something that Aristotle figured out is that if you want to change your behavior, you change the situation, right? Like it's easier for me not to get tempted to look at my phone if my phone's far away. And so definitely for in real life social interactions, I like try to put my phone somewhere else. Um, people send me, now being a happiness expert, people send me these wonderful devices and I get this great uh, device from this company that's making these like bags that you put your phone into. And it's kind of like one of those devices that you don't steal things at like a department store. And so everybody puts their phone in it, but you have to actually take the the thing to like the little opener to open it up and so the idea is like no one can check their phone so everybody's phones are in the thing and you leave them they imagine we get back to you know post-covid dinner parties and the idea is like nobody can open it till at the end till they very explicitly do the little device to like open it up and you know this is what we've gotten to because these stimuli are so interesting so yeah if i could rewind time and get rid of a time before phones, I definitely would. Am I going to give up my iPhone now? No, it's too cool. <laughs> it's got too much good stuff on it. Laurie, that, hang on a second. I've rewound time. Um, and this is my phone. Yeah. It's a really easy thing to do. And, you know, actually, I, I was motivated to get rid of it partly. I mean, I did have one before. Um, but we were going through a sort of cost-cutting exercise yeah. in our household. <laughs> and... Um, it was really expensive. So I got I got a sort of dumb phone. It's like six or seven pounds a month. I suppose that's eight or nine dollars or something like that. Um, no, what's sad is so I've done, I've done the same thing. I went through the dumb phone phase and my colleague, Nick Epley, who actually does, he's a professor at Chicago. He does the most work on smartphones, kind of messing with your happiness and messing with your social connection. He got a dumb phone too. But the two of us both went through the same problem, which is that we travel so much that some of the conveniences of the smartphone from like checking the email to like booking an Uber, it just became too much. And so this is the problem, right? Is that I wish we could have, what I want is not the dumb phone, but like a slightly dumber phone. I want to be like able a, to like an like Uber. Yeah, yeah like a, a, phone of, a phone of medium intelligence. Exactly, exactly. That would be good. There is something, I, I did have a phone like that, which was, um, uh, it's called Punked. Mm. And um, you can at least use these Punked phones as a, uh, a hotspot for your mini iPad. Yeah. That's what I did for a bit. So anyway, sorry, <laughs> more questions. Yeah, more questions. Let's fit in a couple more. We've got Brooke. Brooke, you've got a couple of questions actually. Indeed I do. This is a great topic. Um, last week, uh, Jaron Lanier was saying that when we, um, when we go into virtual reality, you know, with the goggles and all that, and it's this amazing thing, surprisingly what he said was when you take them off that that the awe is is greater about this reality that we have and what that led me to wonder um was do we have to have these like mini pandemics mini lockdowns every so often to remind us and you were saying laurie you were saying that um you know, to have this meditation, a brief meditation when you're in the line at the bank or something and you're pissed off at how long, you know, remember when you couldn't go to the bank and someone stands, you know. So that's one question. Another question, um, that's not really a question, but the other, this other thing is how long does it take an overstressed, depressed student in one of your courses uh, at, at Yale to begin to begin the recovery towards a, a kind of a recovery where it really sticks, where they know they have the tools. And then the final one is the survey, the, the happiness tracking survey. Are you a part of that or aware of that? Yeah, yeah. So on the second one, you know, how long does it take? Again, it, it kind of depends on like how you're defining like success, right? There are interventions we could do with things like meditation and gratitude where you see effects incredibly quickly. My colleague, Hattie Kobu with meditation has an effect that, you know, even your first 10 minutes of meditation, if you do that for a week, you actually reduce people's like mind wandering. You can be more present and notice things better just in a week, right? So some of these things like 10 minutes, you know, 
like seven times is actually a pretty crazy intervention for the kinds of things we're seeing. For whether or not it sticks forever, I mean, I'm a case in point, I know all this stuff, it still takes hard work, right? You know, like, I think just like all habits, right, you have to kind of, you know, keep, stay vigilant and keep working at it. So there's no quick fix for permanent, but there's lots of kind of good habits you can put in place for it. Um, in terms of the ongoing happiness project, there's a bunch of them. I'm not exactly sure which one you're referring to. There's like the World Happiness Project and a bunch of them. I think governments are starting to get hip to the fact that mental health actually matters. And I think this is another thing I'm hoping COVID will help us with is like, you know, there's such a new focus on public health. People are realizing like, holy crap, we didn't put any resources into that. We really need to. And, you know, public health does have a good focus on well-being and time and these kinds of things that I'm hopeful that some of these resources will get put into the survey so. pops up every it pops up every six months and it and it goes for a certain number of things throughout the day you can choose three you can choose five times when it pings you and it says you know what are you thinking about like it gives you several questions it's, it's really pretty wonderful I think I've been doing it since 2015 Oh, that's great. Yeah, I mean, they're different. There are lots of different labs who are using these kinds of tools. Um, you know, this is another, you know, one of the ironies of smartphones, right, is that they're really good apps out there that you can use to track your presence, track your calm, track all your things. You know, on the one hand, you know, it's helpful to kind of measure these things because then you follow them. On the other hand, again, this is something I'm sure Tom can be like, why don't you just be happy? You don't have to track your happiness. This is like so grind type A, you know, so. Um, Laurie, what the, about- oh, um, it's, to, it's the purpose of it is to get information about uh, happiness and what affects it. It's not, it's not to be happier. Yeah, yeah. Now, Laurie, can I, before the next question, thank you so much, Brooke. Can I just ask you one other quick question about magic mushrooms? Um, so you know, this is my resolution from my 50s is to take more magic mushrooms. I had two magic mushrooms on New Year's Eve and it, I think it might have had a good, you know, positive, mental, uh, uh, positive effect on my mental health. Have your researchers or your students or, you know, have you, you must have come across this idea that psilocybin is, um, you know, sort of pretty therapeutic. Yeah, this, so this is like the new hotness in happiness research right now. Not a lot of work before. There was like, it started with like Timothy Leary in like the 60s and it, it like went bad, <laughs> gave people too much. And, you know, like it was before kind of institutional review boards and things like that. Now there's like, you know, very kind of, you know, white coat scientific work on psilocybin and the results are kind of incredible. I mean, they're having just these huge reductions in things like depression and anxiety that stick. Right, so it's not like you have to take mushrooms all the time. It's like one hit has these long standing effects. Um, my colleague, Molly Crockett, who's fantastic, she's actually been doing lots of work on psilocybin and connectedness at Burning Man. So she goes to these festivals and looks at the kind of natural drug use that people are engaged in and trying to see, you know, how does that change their social connection? How does that change their sense of happiness? But she finds it doesn't just change it at the you know, festival, because like, of course, it's going to change at the festival. She finds that like it sticks with you. Um, people become more trusting. They're like more likely to donate money. Like these effects are kind of long-standing. So I think we don't know exactly all the mechanisms, all that stuff. But I think there's, you know, if you take a magic mushroom every once in a while, according to the research, probably a good idea. Or a few. Sorry, Vic. Can't questions. say whether or not it's legal, but yeah. <laughs> research <laughs> within the research study, very good idea. Could we have Sarah Sanson, please? And we're going to have to make it quick. I'm afraid. Sarah, are you there? Yeah, hi, hi. Hi, um, Sarah. Yeah, hi. Yeah, a lot of your stuff that you talked about is is feels like it's very much aimed at, you know, the people at university, obviously, for because of your job. But, you know, there's this kind of edict that uh, you're only ever as happy as your unhappiest child. And I wonder, and we do, we have a daughter with a disability, and that there's a reality there to life. There just is. And I wonder how much of what you talk about applies to people like us, that happiness just has to include the reality. Yeah, well, I think this is a misconception about happiness and, and a big one that we talk about. Actually, there's a recent podcast episode um, with uh, that talks about this with Kristen Neff in detail about kind of self-compassion. And so I think we, we think that happiness has to be the absence of negative emotions. But like negative emotions are part and parcel of like all the stuff that, you know, it's like the feelings of life, right? You know, like a great hangover can be something you indulge in, like good sadness, right? Like a really sad movie, you know, a scary roller coaster, right? Like we want to run away from our negative emotions, but finding ways to like allow them is can be really quite powerful. And like, you know, the tragedy of having a child with a disability, it's this is not decreasing that, like that's really tragic. 
but taking time to notice that, to notice what it feels like to get through it. And there are these wonderful meditation practices. One is called RAIN. Again, all these things have like these cheesy names, but RAIN stands for recognize, allow, investigate, and nurture. And so it's a practice you can go through that's this kind of self-compassion process to recognize I'm feeling frustrated by this. I'm feeling guilty that I'm frustrated by this. I'm a mom, not supposed to feel guilty and frustrated by it. Like you recognize all those emotions, you kind of allow them and you investigate, you kind of hang out with them. You're like, oh, I have these kind of good features. They distract me from the other stuff. Or there's this cool feeling in my chest, right? You kind of just get curious, like idler and sort of sit and notice them. And then you kind of do some nurturing, right? Like if you go through a sucky emotion, it's good to have some like nurturing, make yourself feel good. Not by distracting yourself or like drinking a bunch of booze or whatever, like what could you really do to nurture yourself? And so if you're struggling with negative emotions, which like literally we all are like during lockdown and some people more than others, engaging in that practice of brain could be powerful. But but the, the fast notion is happiness isn't like no negativity at all. It's kind of allowing and noticing and kind of being one with the negativity as part of our human experience. Yeah, that, that was the thing about the um, the idea of sloth in the Middle Ages, wasn't it? That the monks um, uh, were depressed and then the authorities made them feel even worse because they said that being slothful and depressed was itself sinful. So not only were you depressed, but you were told that your depression was... So yeah, it, it, it's sort of... Surely part of happiness is uh, releasing yourself from the pressure to be happy and like allowing yourself to wallow in misery sometimes um why not uh and, and and also you know um drink lots of beer like I, I really think that is great that you're having a a, a a a bottle of you know um serious uh locally brewed stout at lunchtime what time is it for you laurie uh it's now two o'clock so it's a much more reasonable lunch okay. beer hour than when i started which was uh and are, are you gonna have a nap after this as well that's another way of being happy surely <laughs> I might very well. I have I have a four o'clock committee meeting, but a nap before that meeting is going to feel really good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's perfect. And we, I think we're going to have to end it there. As usual, there was more, more questions from all of you. Um, but I think the moment has come to give Laurie an enormous round of applause. So could you all unmute? And thank you, Laurie. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Laurie. That was fantastic. Thank you. Really fantastic. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.